Zombie ships. For over a century, the U.S. Navy Reserve fleets have held the nation's ships. The maintenance process has changed throughout the years. However, the main purpose remains the same, to keep the ships afloat during peacetime, but always ready for battle. The Atlantic and Pacific Reserve fleets were founded around 1912, with operating ships on a reduced schedule. And by the end of World War II, hundreds of assets were no longer needed and grouped in storage sites near shipyards for speedy reactivation. During the Korean War, substantial amounts of time and money were saved at the outset of the conflict, as most ships were readily available. A significant number of the so-called mothball fleets were Liberty-class ships, a mass-produced transport employed during World War II for convoys traveling to and from Europe, Russia, and the U.S. They were also used in the race against the German U-boats, supporting the Navy's warships and ferrying forces across the oceans. Most of these vessels were deactivated and strategically located across the American coasts, and in the 1970s, they started to get scrapped. Despite considerable efforts to maintain the reserve ships in good conditions, it's not uncommon for them to deteriorate and irremediably become obsolete. Therefore, several vessels become inactive and are sold for scrapping, while many others are scuttled in weapons tests. However, some ships are saved on rare occasions due to the involvement of the general public. These lucky vessels have then been turned into museums, memorials, or even artificial reefs. And then there are those that are still waiting to be called into battle. Some include the James River Reserve Fleet in Virginia, Suisun Bay in California, and the Beaumont Reserve Fleet in Texas. End of a war. In late 1918, it was evident that Germany could no longer hold its own during World War I. The German High Command believed their situation was hopeless, while army leadership wanted a ceasefire. The German sailors of the High Seas Fleet then took the matter into their own hands, which gave way to the war's end. As the German sailors' morale increasingly deteriorated and they kept losing trust in their command, a spirit of rebellion against the monarchy ignited. This sentiment was echoed by the general public, which significantly suffered the deprivations of war. By early November, a mutiny erupted and led to the end of the German Empire. The war finally ended with the signing of the Armistice of November 11, 1918. The agreement included the surrender of all German submarines, but the surface fleet's fate remained unclear. As no neutral nation wanted to keep the German ships while a decision was made, it was settled that they would be anchored at Scapa Flow in Scotland and guarded by the Grand Fleet of the Royal Navy. The German fleet, under Admiral Ludwig von Reuter, comprised 15 battleships, 8 cruisers, and 50 destroyers, and by the morning of November 21st, it met with 370 ships of the Royal and Allied Navies. The fleets then reached Firth to Forth and anchored there. However, the ships were not officially surrendered, and skeleton crews boarded them while no British guards were allowed. The German sailors weren't given shore leave or permission to visit other ships. In addition, food was scarce and shoddy, so the sailors had to fish and hunt seagulls to eat and amuse themselves. Thousands of men were eventually sent back to Germany to prevent another mutiny. Of the original 20,000 sailors, less than 5,000 remained by the end of December, and they felt abandoned by the German state. Meanwhile, peace talks kept dragging on in Paris, so Reuter prepared his men to scuttle the ships in case the Allies attempted to seize them. At the same time, the British were prepared to seize the ships in case the Germans tried to scuttle them. On the morning of June 21st, 1919, Orders came from the German admiral to begin scuttling immediately. The crew then opened seacocks and valves and smashed water pipes to facilitate the spread of water. The British could only recover one of the capital ships, three cruisers, and less than half the destroyers, although many more were salvaged in the following decades. The Germans ultimately abandoned the ships on boats under incessant British fire. The nine German sailors who lost their lives that morning were the last casualties of World War I. Last Resort On 
On November 11, 1942, the German and Italian troops surrounded Toulon in southern France in preparation for an incoming Allied invasion. Admiral Jean de Labor and André Marquis received orders from the Vichy High Command to withhold foreign troops and deny them access to Navy establishments or the French fleet's ships. However, if they couldn't achieve this without spilling any blood, then the ships ought to be scuttled. The Panzer Division appeared unstoppable after the German forces punched through the Allied defenses in the French-Belgian border. France was willing to surrender and was therefore split into the Occupied Zone and Free Zone, where the government settled in the resort city of Vichy. Later on, the Free Zone would become known as Vichy France. This territory was now in charge of the French Navy, the second largest in Europe. The Allies, and especially the British, were determined to keep it away from German control at all costs. Thus, they backed free French General Charles de Gaulle and the idea that all French vessels were to be surrendered at either a neutral or British port. Furthermore, the British would seize or scuttle any ship under Vichy France, and what remained of the French fleet was docked at Toulon. Top Nazi leaders were desperate to prevent Vichy France's government from switching sides and supported the German Navy's Operation Lila to capture the French vessels. The Germans planned to hand the ships over to their Italian allies. However, on November 27th, what was left of the French fleet was scuttled to prevent German forces from taking them over. Initially, the crews were hostile to the Allied invasion of Toulon, but the anti-German sentiment proved stronger, and the chant of Long live de Gaulle, set sail, could be heard across many ships. Le Bois finally ordered the scuttling, and explosives were placed on 164 ships. They all sank to the bottom of the Mediterranean, far away from Nazi hands. Ghost Fleet A scenic and historic site rests at Malau's Bay on the Maryland side of the Potomac River in Charles County. The location holds what is known to be the largest shipwreck fleet in the entire Western Hemisphere. And although most of these ships were built to operate during World War I, they never really served their purpose. In the first decades of the 20th century, the U.S. undertook a hurried shipbuilding system in preparation for war, and the Ghost Fleet, as it's dubbed, is mostly made up of ships built during President Wilson's administration. However, America only entered the war by mid-1917, and by then, the German U-boat threat was destroying over 200 merchant ships per month. The Emergency Fleet Corporation was then founded to meet the urgent shipping needs of the time. The ambitious plan called for steel and wooden ships, which would be built across 17 states in 40 shipyards. The wooden steamships would support the war effort as a merchant fleet. Furthermore, they could be constructed hastily. But setbacks stemming from delays and shortages in the timber reserves complicated the process. Upon completing the fleet by the end of World War I, the ships were mostly obsolete and subsequently stored in the James River. Their maintenance cost $50,000 a month, so the Navy did not want to keep them and sold them to the Western Marine and Salvage Company. Sometime later, they were moved to the Potomac River, and in 1925, they were towed to Mallows Bay. When Western Marine went bankrupt, the ships were burned, and their remains stayed there for nearly a century. Marine flora and fauna have turned the wrecks into abundant islands that can be visited, and in 2019, the bay was declared a national marine sanctuary. Deserted Ships In the vast steppes of Central Asia, on the border of the former Soviet republics of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, lay the hulls of a Soviet fleet rusting in the middle of the desert. However, the place once held a mighty body of water, and the fishing boats rest miles from what used to be the fourth largest inland sea on the planet. Thousands of people used to profit from the Aral Sea. A wholesome fishing industry thrived in the town of Moynak, which housed a considerable fishing fleet. In addition, a prosperous canning industry processed the catch. But a controversial Soviet strategy set the ultimate fate of the Aral Sea. When the Soviet Union decided to divert the rivers that fed the Aral to irrigate the cotton fields in Uzbekistan, the immense lake was starved of water. In the 1960s, the lake began receding as the water evaporated in the desertic climate. Hence, it became increasingly salty, and the fish started to die because of the concentration of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Eventually, the locals were obliged to move away, 
and the rusty boats and decaying buildings are still visited by wandering cattle. But the catastrophe also affected the environment and the climate. The dusty bed of the Aralkum Desert set off health problems in neighboring towns caused by toxic particles swirled by the wind. Several measures have been taken by allowing rivers to flow back to the northern part of the sea in Kazakhstan, reducing salinity and increasing fish populations. Perhaps one day in the coming decades, the waters will engulf the lost fleet anchored in the dry lands of the formerly rich plains. Thank you for watching our video. Please subscribe to our Dark Five channel for even more eerie stories and interesting facts. And also check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels and let us know what you think in the comments below.